Good to see the folks in the class and on Zoom. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to, we're continuing on in the book of Romans. And I want to, we're going to, I, I want to just start reading from, from verse 17 onward. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen and being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. All right, so in verse 17, it talks about, we, we, we really covered this much last time, and it was in verse 17, it says, But the righteous man shall live by faith. And let me establish, there is no righteousness in and of ourselves. This is a judicial righteousness that is declared upon us by God. We can liken it to a man or a woman who has been deemed guilty of a crime and then the President of the United States gives them a pardon. Once they have that pardon, they can live as if they had never committed that crime. But they're never declared not guilty because of the pardon. The pardon never declares them not guilty. It just says that that they will no longer have to uh, uh, suffer a penalty for that crime. This is a judicial, judicial righteousness that is put upon us because of Jesus, because of the work that Jesus has done. That's what this is all about, this righteousness. And then he then I want to also look at another verse before we get into verse 18. I want, want to look at, at Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9. We mentioned it last time. I'm going to mention it again. Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, because we have to recalibrate our own attitudes. We have to recalibrate us versus who we are versus who God is. In Isaiah 55, verse 8, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens are, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So God specifically says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. All right. So if you have a way, that's not God's way. Your thoughts are not God's thoughts. He says, for as high as the heavens are above the earth. So he's he's taking two extremes. He says, my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. All right, so I want you to to, to hold hold that understanding that God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are different than our ways. They are higher than our ways. They are better than our ways. Our ways are corrupt. Our thoughts are corrupt. So we cannot always use our own human sensibilities to assess what God should do or what He shouldn't do. He knows exactly what He needs to do. He does not need our approval. He does not, he does not care about our thoughts on this in, in, in any sense. He does what is right. Humans have all sorts of thoughts that, well, you know, God should do this. God should do that. You know, if God were all loving, He would do this. Well, how do you know that? How do you know that? How do you know that anything about what you said? God just, He clearly says His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. It's, it's just different. It's just different and it's higher. Whatever we have in our own sensibilities is corrupt. 
So he says in verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Ungodliness is irreverence. Unrighteousness is offense against his moral code. All right? His wrath is revealed from heaven against irreverence or ungodliness, against unrighteousness, things against his moral code, of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So it's interesting that his wrath is against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. It doesn't say that his wrath is against men. We'd be doomed. It says that his wrath is against the, un, the ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men. You see the distinction. It's not the wrath against men. It's the wrath against their actions. It's the wrath against their ungodliness, their unre- irreverence to God, their unrighteousness, their, their, their actions that violate his moral code. That's what it's against. The unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Nothing in this whole passage that we're going to be reading today is passive. It is all active. The wrath of God is revealed. This is not like, ta-da, I'm here. This is, boom, it's coming. The wrath of God is coming. It is going forth. The wrath of God is upon us. And it's men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. It's not... Oh, I didn't know. You can't hold that against me. I just didn't know. No, the Bible says it's actually very different. It says you're suppressing the truth. So in other words, the truth is trying to rise up and affect our lives. And we're holding it down. We are suppressing the truth. We're holding it down. It is an active suppression. And it is an active going forth of God's wrath. Nothing in this is passive. So let me say something about this whole section. We got done with a beautiful section in verses 1 through 18 of this chapter where God is talking about salvation and beautiful things and now we're looking at a totally different facet. It's as if we have a crystal and we're looking at a different facet. I don't know this God. I don't know this God. This God is coming with wrath. Now, clearly, this is true, that God is like this. But I don't know that sort of God. Let me put it this way. I have two granddaughters, and I love them so much. It is not my job to discipline them. I just love them. If they say they want ice cream, I say to them, you can have all the ice cream you want. That's what I tell them. I take them to Marble Slab, and, and uh, uh, they say, could I have that topping? I say, you can have all the toppings, all of them. You, you name it, you got it. If you want double, I'll tell the lady, put double. Whatever you want, you get. That's the God that I know. I don't know a God of wrath. I'm just telling you, I don't know a God of wrath. Jesus appeared to me when I was 18 years old, and I have never known a God of wrath. Even when I do wrong, he doesn't even look at me with disappointment. I mean, just the Holy Spirit. I'm like, Lord, I'm sorry. And he's just loving me. This is the God that I know. My youngest granddaughter, she sits in my chair at the head of the, the, the table where we eat. And she, she sits in the chair because it's the only chair with the, the, the you know, armrests. The other chairs don't. So, so her, her booster chair wouldn't slide off it. But now that she's gotten even bigger, she still sits in that chair. She comes to my office. She sits in my chair in my office. And I'm happy about that. That's the God that I know. I don't know a God of wrath. I just don't know. I've never seen a God of wrath toward me. I only know a God of love. One day when my youngest granddaughter was about four years old, she was doing something that was dangerous. And I said, no. And she looked at me and just burst out crying because she had never heard me say no to her. I said, I'll never say no to you again. 
I'll only say, be careful. And I, I'm committed. I'm just, I just say to her, be careful. And if she's getting into something, I just go pick her up and, and move her. It's easy. You just pick her up and move. I don't even know a God who says no to me. I don't. I mean, th- my relationship with Jesus, my relationship with God is through His Son, Jesus, who is so good to me. He just displays love to me. I don't know a God of wrath. I never see God through this facet, through this face of this crystal where there is wrath. Clearly God is a God of wrath because the Bible says so. But I don't know it. So what I'm describing to you is not what He pours out upon His children. I mean, I don't even say to my grand, granddaughter, no. I just say, be careful. And I'll move her. Because I don't want to tell her no. Anything she wants. It's up to my daughter to discipline her. My daughter says, D- you know, I, I take them to Claire's, the little girl's store. Where they buy. My, my daughter says to me, only buy them one toy. Dad, only buy them one toy. So, you know, I take, I can't buy them only one toy. I mean, how can I do that? So I buy them usually some nice box. I say, whatever fits in that box, you can have. I mean, so, <laughs> so they come back with a box full of toys. And my daughter says, I told you only one. Well, I said, you know, in Hebrew, <clears throat> there's different kinds of one. <laughs> there's, there's yachid, which is <clears throat> one, a singular one, like a spoon. And there's echad, which is a composite one, like a table. A table has a surface and legs. That's, that, that's echad. It's a composite one. You didn't specify which one. You know, I don't know which one you were talking about. I thought you were saying echad. It was all in one box. It's a composite one. I can't tell my granddaughters no. One, one day... One granddaughter, she picked up a toy. I said, you can have that if you want, but why don't you look around and see if you want something else? And then she, I said, okay, you could have that if you want. See, and then, then she went and she took all of them. She said, you, could have, you said I could have all of these. So what am I going to say? I had to get it for her. This is the God that I know. I don't know a God of wrath. So what we're learning about is not his treatment of his children. This is not the way he treats us. He is kind and gracious in every way toward His children. And that's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come to Me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus just beckons us to come. He says, Take My yoke upon you and learn from Me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. He says, Come to Me. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight through 30, Come to Me. He says, I'm gentle, I'm humble in heart. This is the God whom I know. I don't even know a God of wrath. So as we go through this, just remember, God deals with us as His children through Jesus Christ. Jesus is is our shield. When I mess up, I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. He, He doesn't even have to look at me in a cross manner. He doesn't. He just continues to love me. And it melts my heart. That's the God that I know. That's the God that I want you to know. He is so kind and so gracious in every way. This thing where His wrath is revealed from heaven, that's not for us. That's not for us. That's not the way He deals with us. So let's look back at Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They are suppressing it. It's an act of suppression. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and His divine nature have been clearly seen, clearly seen, being understood, understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. This is general revelation. This is something that He gives to all people no matter where they are. The hypothetical apologists, man on the island, woman on the island. General revelation comes to everyone no matter where they are. Saudi Arabia, it comes General revelation. 
because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. You can say, well, do they, do they really have a witness? Yes! Because how do I know? Because the Bible says they do. The Bible says they do. And the Bible's right. I came to the Lord right after my 18th birthday. It is hard for me to remember what it was like before I knew the Lord. I can't imagine waking up in the morning and not knowing the Lord. I can't imagine what that would be like. And I try to think back, what was it like? I thought a lot about God even though I was denying God. I was denying His existence. And I would think about Him all the time as I, as I think back on things. I remember things that I did wrong. And the conviction that I would feel. I'd feel miserable about, about what I did. Long before I knew God, my conscience bore witness to me that I had done wrong. And I thought about God. And I remember trying to read the Bible and it made no sense. And I, and I bought, I bought uh, uh, the Ten Commandments and the Lord's Prayer on a penny. It's a shortened version of it. And they would squash out a penny and you know, flatten it out. And you could put it on a keychain. And I don't know why I bought it. I don't know why. And, and, and back in those days, to buy these things, you, you had to, you know, I had to get my mother to write a check and you'd put it in an envelope and a month later you'd get what you ordered. Remember those days? And, 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 uh, um, and that's what it was like. But there was a searching. There was something in my heart long before I knew him. And the Bible says that. It says, that which is known about God is evident within them. It's already there in them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, he says to everybody, since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature. Think about that. His attributes, God's attributes, His power and His divine nature have been clearly seen. Remember, this is not my understanding. My understanding is corrupt. This is not your understanding. Your understanding is corrupt. Don't judge this by your own sensibilities because they're corrupt. God says it's clearly seen. God is the one who says it's clearly seen. This is clearly seen. You know something of His, in, uh, of his attributes? You know His power, you know His divine nature, it's clearly seen, being understood, and it's understood by every man and woman on the face of this earth through what, is, through what has been made so that they are without excuse. This is general revelation. A person can begin to open their heart more toward God because of general revelation. And that's what God looks for. And this is why, this is why, this is what explains. There was a young lady in this class 20 years ago. Young lady in this class. And she was from the Dallas area, somewhere outside of Dallas. So, sort of, you know, middle America, north Texas. And she has this burden that she wants to go to the Sudan. I mean... You ask most Americans, look on this map and tell me where's Sudan. Uh, I don't know. I have no idea. She wants to go live there. I said, have you ever been to Sudan? No. Have you ever been to Africa? No. But you want to go to Sudan? Yeah, I really want to go to Sudan. She had a burden to go to the Sudan. At the same time, there was a young man whom I didn't know, from Missouri, middle America. He's doing his master's degree in electrical engineering at Stanford University. He has a burden to go to the Sudan to witness God to the people there. Why? Well, both of them go independently. They end up on the same mission organization. And they end up getting married. And now they have five kids. And they had to flee from the Sudan because there was a civil war going on. And they got a plane out 
just as, 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 as they were, had to flee. And now they live in a neighboring country and they're working with Sudanese, the four speaking people, the people who speak four from the Sudan. And they can witness far more openly because they're in another more open country and the, and the Sudanese are coming to them, the refugees. How do you explain it? Why should a young lady in North Texas care about someone in the Sudan? Because someone in the Sudan is responding to general revelation. And so God is going to take somebody and send a missionary. Because nobody can get saved through general revelation. Nobody can get saved through that. If a person could get saved through general revelation, the worst thing that you could do is send them a missionary. That's the worst thing that you could do. Because if a person could get saved just by not knowing God, just by never hearing the gospel, if they could get saved by never hearing the gospel, why send them a missionary and risk them denying the truth that's sent to them and end up going to hell? If they can get saved just by not hearing the gospel. So the proverbial man on the island, the proverbial woman on the island who never hears... Could they get saved? The answer is no. You can only get saved through the gospel message, which is Jesus Christ has died for your sins. He was buried and he was raised from the dead, according to your sins. Those who died before Jesus, before they ever went to heaven, they had to receive that gospel message and it was given to them. them. Because Jesus went, remember, Sheol was two distinct places. Jesus describes this for us. There's people on one side of a chasm. There's people on another side of the chasm. One on the good side in the bosom of Abraham. One on the bad side in torment and fire and thirst. And a chasm between them. But they can see each other and they can talk across it. But it is a far distance, it says. But somehow they can communicate. When Jesus went, he went to the good side and he took the captivity captive and he brought them with him. He went and he preached the gospel to them. Behold, I am here, risen from the dead. Before they entered heaven, they received this gospel message. The worst thing you could do, if a person could get received without the gospel, is to send a missionary to them. Why give them a chance to deny it and end up in hell? There is receipt only through the gospel message. That's not my word. Remember, if that seems cruel to you, your taste is corrupt. God knows what He's doing. His ways are higher than our our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He knows what He's doing. He's the one who set up this pattern, not me. Remember, this word has it right. Every word in this book is true. Every word in this book is true, right, holy. What's in our mind is incorrect and corrupt. Human sensibilities shall not be our judge. The Word of God is our judge. He said it is made clear such that to the point in verse 20, the end of verse 20, they are without excuse. Because if they respond to the general revelation that is there, more witness comes. He will send somebody from 5,000 miles away to go and drop in on that person and give them the gospel if they respond to the truth that's given to them. You say, well, what about the person who's born in the middle of Saudi Arabia? You know, you have much more chance of receiving the gospel here than they do there. How do you know? How do you know? Through your corrupt mind, which is wrong, that's how you know. Through your sensibilities that are wrong, that's how you know. How do you know God has not placed every person in the optimized condition for their receipt of the gospel? How do you know? You know, I can tell you, if I were if I were six foot four and really handsome and everything and had girls fawning all over me, I don't think I'd have come to the Lord. I don't think I would have come to the Lord. If I had the movie star look and the life of every party, I don't think I'd have come to the Lord. 
I was just the opposite. I was just the opposite. And it, ma- it made me a lot more responsive to the Lord. How do you know that God hasn't put every person in the optimal position? How do you know? Maybe if, if they had been born here rather than in Saudi Arabia, what, what, what home would you like them to be born into? Into a rich home? So they get corrupted by riches? How do you know? There's a lot of kids born in Christian homes that walk away from the Lord. How do you know? God in His ways does everything right and I have total security in His decision. Total security doesn't bother me a bit. I don't try to figure this thing out and rationalize it because I have set my mind to believing His Word and to believing that He is good and righteous and holy. And He has given, His witness has gone out such that everybody, everybody is without excuse because it says it right here. It says in verse 21, for even though they knew God, even though they knew God, They knew God. They did not honor Him as God. Or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. They knew God. They had enough revelation. Everybody has enough general revelation to act upon for God to send more. But when we don't honor what He's put before us, when we don't give thanks for what He's given before us, and we start coming with our futile speculations, then God says, the foolish heart was darkened. Nothing is passive here. It didn't darken by itself. Darkening comes upon it. Their foolish heart was darkened. If I say that wall was painted, you think, oh, that's interesting. Somehow paint just sort of happened to settle in upon it gradually. No! It was painted. Their foolish heart was darkened. Darkness came to their heart. When we respond to the light that God gives us, He gives more light. When we... When we, uh, uh, when we resist that, when we resist that, when we suppress it, as it says in verse 18, when we res- suppress it, there is less light. And that's what he says. But he says they knew God. They knew enough about Him to respond to the light. No person could ever claim that God didn't do this. God did it. He's just. He's right. His ways are different than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Then he says, he says, uh, um, verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools. So the next step, and what he's going to deal with, he, he's putting everybody under condemnation. Paul is, is just racking it up here. You have the Greeks, and you had, you had, you had the cultured Greeks, and you had what, what he calls, what they call here, what the Greeks call barbarians, which we would call pagans. So you have the cultured Greeks, and you have the pagan barbarians, and you have the Jews. And he's going he's to go through each class and show that each one. And he starts with, with, with the barbarians. And he says that, that professing to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. So, it's different than we learn in Anthropology 101 that people went from being polytheistic to monotheistic. The Bible says it's just the, diff- just the opposite. They went from monotheism to polytheism. They went from the one God to the many. He says, professing to be wise, they became fools. When we think ourselves wise and we profess, I know, I know that, I know. God says, you just became a fool. We're not supposed to call people fools, but the Bible can call people fools because God's God. He can do what he wants. He's above us. He says, they just became fools. 
when they think they understood this, they just became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, birds, four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. And that's why people worship all sorts of things. Verse 24, Therefore God gave them over to lusts of their hearts, in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. This God giving them over is not this concept that all God has to do is He lifts His hands off us and there's enough corruption in our hearts to take us into all sorts of places. That's not what this is talking about. It says God gave them over. God gave them. The judge turns the guilty party over to the bailiff and says, put him in jail. The God gives the guilty party to the executioner and says, execute. This is a giving over. There's nothing passive in this. It is all active. God gives them over. You say, well, an all-loving God, I can't see that. Yes, because your ways are corrupt. His ways are not our ways. Now, I'm telling you, I don't know this facet of God. I don't know that facet of God. Like my granddaughter does not know that I can be grumpy. My granddaughter does not know that I can get angry. My wife knows. You can ask Cherie. But my granddaughter doesn't know that. Papa is all loving. No matter what time of day. And, you know, they, they come to the U.S. They're, they're eight hours ahead of us. And, you know, at two in the morning, she's waking me up. You know? It's okay. It's okay. Because I'm her papa. I'm not going to get upset with her. Because I'm her papa. That's the God whom I know. That's the God whom I know. I don't know this God. But this is a facet of God that I personally don't know. I've never experienced. But it is a facet of God. God gives them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. This is heterosexual impurity. People have heterosexual desires. And he takes that, which is inherently, that's a desire. That's, that's, that, that, that's, that's uh, uh, um, heterosexual tendencies. But he turns it over to an extreme so it becomes a dominance in their lives. It was never there to become the dominant force in our life. He gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies were dishonored among them. Why would he do this? For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. So he's telling you why he did this. Because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. In other words, they had the truth. They had the truth. But they exchanged it for a lie. It was not passive. It was an active exchange. And they worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. That is what happens. There is a danger in not following God. There's a danger in that. It's dangerous not to follow God. I want to close with this verse. 1 John 2, 1 John chapter 2. 1 John. This is the epistle of 1 John chapter 2. This is a a few books before the book of Revelation. Chapter 2, verse 16. 1 John 2, verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. The one who does the will of God lives forever. I invite you this day to live for God. I invite you this day to live for Him. These things of the world are passing away. These things that can grab our attention, they are really passing away. They're not from God. These things distract us. I urge you to come to Him and to know Him, to know Him richly, to know Him deeply. God is so good 
I urge you to come and to know him. I want you to know the God whom I know. He's not a God who displays wrath. I don't know his wrath. Every bit of God that I know is through this prism of my Lord Jesus Christ. Everything about God comes through my Lord Jesus Christ. And everything that comes through my Lord Jesus Christ is good and kind and holy and righteous. He never even looks at me crossly. He just continues to love me. And it melts my heart. And when I do wrong, I'm convicted. And he doesn't say, how could you do such a thing? I've never felt that from my Lord. I've only felt welcoming and loving. And that's the Lord that I want you to know. And that comes through knowing Jesus. That comes through knowing him. I urge you this day to know him. He gave his life for you. He was buried and he was raised from the dead. And in that there is hope. That is the message of the gospel. That's the truth of the gospel. Come to him this day, I pray. Oh, come to him. If you don't know him, please give your heart to him this day. And if you do, you've got to contact me. You've got to send me an email. And you can't do it tomorrow. You've got to, you've got to do it within this hour. You owe me this. You owe me at least this. If I give you this hour, within an hour, you've got to, you've got to email me and let me know that you gave your heart to Jesus this day. You've got to let me know that. Because he's so good. I want you to know him. And then I will set you up for a few lessons to get to know him better. So we get this just, just going off right, right in the right way. Okay? Let's close in prayer. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you, Lord, for the facet of God, which is a God of wrath. But I thank you, Lord, that I have never known this in my life. I thank you, Lord, that everything ever that I have seen has come through Jesus Christ, who is my advocate who is the one who gave his life for me. Oh, how I love Jesus. Lord Jesus, I thank you that everything, everything that I have seen is good and holy and righteous and kind and loving. Every way that you have treated me is with grace and kindness. Lord, I pray for those here who do not know you that you would save their souls this day. Oh, Lord, save their souls. That they would pray this very day, Lord, forgive me because I am a sinner. Lord, come into my life, I pray. Forgive me. Come into my life. Thank you, Lord, for dying for me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving my soul. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. And Father, I pray for the believers who are here that they would get to know you, Lord, like I know you. Just kindness. Always, always kindness. That they would love you all the more because of what they've learned this day. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I give you many thanks. Amen.